This podcast is brought to you by Connect First Credit Union. You know, we have a really special guest on our show today, and I think it's going to be a great story because one of the things we talk about a lot on What's Next Alberta is about the future of the province, and, and we all know technology is going to play a big role in that. But, you know, when we stop and sit back and think about, you know, success stories in technology in Alberta, sometimes we're left wondering, like, is what is really happening out there? And we hear a lot about the startups and the, the budding new ventures that are coming our way and which will transform our province in many respects. But sometimes we overlook the very successful enterprises that are already here, making a name for Alberta, for Albertans, you know, in the world, you know, changing the way other organizations work and what have you. And and today we have a great guest um, to join us and talk a little bit about that. His name's Doug Van Spronson, and the founder of a great company called Verset, which is a digital strategy firm. And that is truly uh, changing the world of digital. Um, they've got some unique models. And Doug, I don't want to waste any more time to bring you on the show. Doug, welcome to the podcast. So great to be here. Appreciate it. I tell our audience a little bit about Verset yeah. and the company you've built. Sure. Well, I think this has been a, a story that continues to evolve, and, and a lot of people have been kind of co-authors in that story. But uh, Verset, uh, at its core, um, missionally, exists to unlock human ambition. And and how we do that is through a, a process of co-creation, and that process is built to really help build incredible user experiences, software, apps, platforms. So think about digital things. Right. So we built the company uh, with that kind of core belief that within teams, within organizations, within companies, there are big ambitions that are there. Right on. Um, and to get there, we have to think through, well, how do we sort of raise that up within the companies and, and really transform that into world-leading technology? So that's what we built the company to do. And we've been able to do that with some incredible companies across the world. Uh, the company's headquartered here, and we have offices in Toronto and Vancouver, and now in Europe, um, Paris and Brussels. So it's been a really cool story uh, to see. And uh, and we're, yeah, still riding that that dream. You've built a great reputation in the world with large enterprises, you know, doing business with them. How did, you know, you build the confidence? You know, you're starting this business in in Alberta, going out to the, some of these global companies, mm -hmm. national companies that you're dealing with to, uh, to say, hey, take a chance on us and mm -hmm. let us help you. I think there is a lot of value that can be created when you look at the world through different lenses. And and one of the lenses that that we've really focused on is saying, you know, if you look at the history of, of the globe, the world has never kind of gone backwards in terms of making better experiences. If you kind of think about something as 20 years ago, it's generally gotten better over time. Totally. It's a one direction kind of street. And so that sort of optimism, I think, is built into a lot of our work. And so when we started thinking about, well, how what role does technology play in businesses? How do we create and generate delightful experiences for companies and their customers, that seems obvious, but it's actually really hard to do. Yeah. And so our job was to sort of figure out how to unlock that and build in a, a, a real cap capability for us, but then also to figure out ways to build that in the companies we're working with. Uh, and so I think when we started to do that, you know, companies started to notice, and it is a global world. And yeah. you know, from the very beginning, we started around 10 years ago, uh, our clients were global in nature, and I think they were looking for sparks of sort of innovation and ways of doing things differently. And and uh, we were able to compile a group of people who were really interested in doing that. And, right and that's really been the, the ride so far. And that is a pretty novel model, right? Like, because most companies, you know, and if you're supporting the development of a product or solution mm -hmm. for another company, you don't want to necessarily transfer all that knowledge to them right. so they don't need you anymore. Right. So, like, even that... You know, did people say you're you're kind of a little bit crazy here, mm -hmm. like giving mm -hmm. away all your your intelligence? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's actually kind of funny because we we like to to poke fun at some of our our competitors, but I think there is a mindset within traditional consulting that your job is to never leave. Right, right. Like, right. You, yeah. You're there to <laughs> just right. continue. That's the whole business right model on. is to never leave. But I think what we've observed is that when you're creating, say, a website or a app or a platform, something that's really touching your customers every day in a meaningful way, most of the value accrues in how that's operated. It's right. not in the building of it. It's, right. it's how you operate it in, in perpetuity ongoing. And so, you know, I mentioned off the top that we do this through co-creation. Right. And uh, that's a term that's sort of ambiguous. Yeah. People kind of say, well, what does that mean? Yeah. But for us, I think if you think about a continuum, you know, on one side, you have more push, like directive. So we're helping you give ex expertise and telling you what to do. Uh, on the other hand, you have more pull, which is right. about how are we coaching, what's within the organization already, how do we transition that into something meaningful? And I think what we've observed is that 
if we're more on that side, if we're helping co-create these, these new ideas, bring new products to life, and helping build up those internal capabilities within the companies, there's so much more value creation that comes from that. And it lasts long, right? There's, there's something that yeah. actually changes. And so we, we see a huge future where organizations are able to expand their digital capabilities to impact whatever they are impacting, whether that's their customers, whether that's internal. Uh, and that's a huge joy because there's yeah. just a, a massive amount of... Uh, fun that can come from making something meaningful. But if all of that goes into creating it and then it withers on the vine after, I don't think our job's done. And yeah. so, yeah, it, it does mean that we have to kind of change how we work and how we adopt. But our clients, uh, I think, appreciate that that perspective and, and, and the results are there. We know that it actually works better over time. So when you go back in time a little bit, Doug, or go back in time a little bit with me, if you don't mind, like when you were starting Verset, what were some of the initial experiences you were having? How did you recruit your first employees? How did mm -hmm. you convince them to join you? Could you find the talent you needed? How did you convince those first uh, customers to, to be, you know, become your customer? That's a story that probably has so many ups and downs. It's hard to, you know, the line always looks like this, but really it's like yeah. this in so yeah. many ways. Um, I think though, any service business is about people. We yeah. have no other asset really. Yeah. It's people and computers, as I like to say, and computers are all the same. So we can buy MacBooks, but finding the right people is what really matters. And so We've embedded from the start, you know, how do we create a space where people can do their best, where they can yeah. really uh, meaningfully contribute to something interesting and then create the conditions for them to thrive. Right. And, and that's been a, a really important part of our DNA from the start. Right on. Because we put that out there, I think it attracts a different type of person. I think actually being in Alberta was a huge advantage to us at the beginning uh, because we were able to be sort of an employer of choice if you were kind of one of these weird people who were really <laughs> passionate about user experience design or a big, you know, impactful developer. We were one of maybe a handful of companies here that you could work for. And right. I think that was a huge advantage. Um, so that was a, a good kickstart. And then globally, it's quite interesting, but... Uh, Alberta and Canada's reputation more broadly uh, is is different. You know, when you work on projects, we have pro active projects in the UK, in Dubai, uh, all over the world. Incredible. Um, and the reputation of Canada is really strong. And I think there's yeah. actually uh, some interesting nuance that has contributed to our success in some ways where uh, people just say, well, they, they're Canadians, they must know. What Isn't that funny, right? Because here, <laughs> when we sit here, we think like, why would anybody in the world want what we've got, yeah, totally. right? Yeah. And, yeah. and so that that's a very cool story. Now, Fast forward 10 years, you've built a very significant business. Like how many employees do you have now? Uh, we have just over 250-ish. Yeah, yeah incredible, so. right? Yeah. Like that's a very sizable organization. And you've been, had received a fair amount of recognition too for what you've built. Yeah. So I believe you were the entrepreneur of the year, uh, the NY entrepreneur of the year in 2019. Yeah. Top 40 under 40. Like Doug, you've 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 got some incredible accomplishments oh, here. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I'm not trying to embarrass you a little bit, but <laughs> yeah. like you're a little bit of a celebrity on our show. And a lot of people in this province um, owe their employment to what you've built, which is pretty incredible. When you're looking ahead now, um, you know, in the next few years in Alberta and you see the, the ecosystem that's building, mm. like what are your thoughts around the future of technology in mm. this province? That's a big topic. It's something we think about a lot, right? Because we kind of depend on this talent pool growing and evolving and changing. And I think uh, there are a lot of kind of global trends that are uh, making that challenging. I think, you know, I spoke to the, the fact we could be the employer of choice in a smaller market. Uh, that's eroded now with more of a uh, work from home, you know, global workforce right. mentality. That's actually changed a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I, I'm an optimist about Alberta's future. Uh, I think some of the challenges there, you know, maybe one way to frame it, like there's a lot of uh, a lot of energy and time when you're thinking about innovation or growing a technology sector, if that's the, the kind of space you're trying to to impact. We tend to think about things from, you know, how do we take what we have and create yeah. something out of that? What can we build on top of what we have and then sort of go out to the market? And I think that way of thinking, whether it's a company or a university or a city, is kind of flawed. There's a challenge there because it's really focused on the supply side. So it's mm. saying, what does, you know, Alberta have or what does an organization have and how do we torque that in a way to make something new? I look, tend to look at it on the demand side. So if you think about economics, there's supply and demand. And I think there is a greater emphasis we can place on what are people needing? What are entrepreneurs really needing? And how do we meet that need versus saying, 
we have a lot of office space, for example. <laughs> how do so we how convert do we that it? into we, that? Yeah. And, and, and I think, and I'm not throwing stones at that. I think there's a lot of good that can come from it. But I'm really interested in what we're able to do by really listening to what the ecosystem needs um, and how do we create that. And that could be capital, that can be talent, that can be different ideas. Um, but I think that's an area where um, I'm optimistic we can we can start to build towards. Yeah, right on. And uh, in today's world, that's actually pretty refreshing thought. You're absolutely right. We spend too much time focusing on what we've got to sell as opposed to what we uh, what we can do to solve problems mm-hmm. for others, right? Mm-hmm. Building um, a dam instead of uh, finding the river. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good way of putting it, actually. And through our conversation, you spoke a lot about systems. You know, when you think about then like the Alberta um, framework or the Alberta you know, offering we have, like what kind of systems do we need to, to make that come true to mm. be more demand focused? And I've looked a little bit into this because it's kind of an interesting question. Like, what builds a tech ecosystem? Let's just pick that one as, as an example. If you look at sort of the, the global context of that question, it's typically relied on capital. So yeah. how is capital flowing into and out of entrepreneurs? And that has been something that's typically been generated by private capital. So, right. you know, angel investors, yeah. usually created by exits, that right. sort of flow back into the community because they're risk uh, adjusted. They understand that they're, this is how dreams are made. Right on. Canada and generally Alberta, more specifically, and Calgary, Edmonton, even more directly, hadn't had a lot of those exits, but those are starting to happen. And we started to see some real movement there. We've had a couple of unicorns that are being created here. And so that kind of mints new money. I think that is something that we have to admit is a big part of the tech ecosystem. The other ingredients would be things like university ecosystem, which is very robust here. If you think about machine learning and AI, um, those types of things. So that's starting to develop. Right on. And then incentives and sort of programs that sort of enable that to be the choice location. And that could be anything from a visa to a cost of living um, adjustment, those kind of things. So those ingredients, I think, are starting to emerge. So I'm bullish on that coming together. But I do take a realistic view that there is a lot of competition. We are not the only city and the only province trying to attract these same people. And so I think if you look at those ingredients and say, well, we'll combine, you know, you could do it here or you could do it in Portugal or you could do it in Denver or whatever, Um, I think the funding model where the most opportunity is, is if you think about, again, going back to innovation kind of lenses, most of the most innovation-driven inventions of our time, whatever it is, didn't start with the objective of creating that thing. Right on. It got there through a series of different things that were interconnected. And so part of our opportunity is to think about loosening the strings of what's being supported and grown and invested in. Uh, and making that a bit wider and saying, well, we're not trying to mint the next unicorn. We're trying to fund ideas. You know, if you think about any meaningful invention, that's that's really been the through line. It hasn't been, we want to invent uh, a reason to, you know, to build a, a nuclear submarine or, right. you know, whatever that thing is. Right. It's like, it's a bunch of series of steps that are kind of interconnected. And so I think a, an objective-based funding model can kind of reduce the chances of success in those outcomes, which is, I think a little counterintuitive, but my hope would be that we'd create systems where uh, we're spreading that out a lot wider to see right what on. kind of bubbles up, um, which is kind of going back to that demand side of the equation a little bit. Like, what are what are yeah. people looking for? And now, I'm sure there's going to be members of our audience that are listening here who are thinking about taking steps to found their own business mm-hmm. and so on. And as somebody who's done it, and I'm sure you've had some trials and tribulations along the way. For sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Heart-breaking uh, moments yeah. and, and moments of euphoria and everything in between. What advice would you have for that person who's stepping into it today? I think there's never been a better time in history to start a company. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that was true a year ago. I think it's more true today, even wow. with the economic picture. Um, if you think about the uh, connectedness to the globe, uh, mm-hmm. you're able to find markets that were not there before. You know, 50 years ago, as an entrepreneur, your domain was limited by your postal code. Yeah, right <laughs> now, now it's the globe. And I think that's really fascinating. There's a lot of access and willingness to fund ideas where that was not a constant. Now, of course, that's changing and, and shifting. I think we've seen a down downturn in some of that environment, but generally, capital is there if the idea is there. So what's really missing, I think, in that question is, is ambition. Like, how do you take that and move it forward? And so I think for people who are thinking about that leap, uh, some of the best companies in history were born in recessions. Of course, we're not there yet, but <laughs> yeah. there could be. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if you think about, you know, that can often create a really good conditions for building something interesting. So, totally. yeah, I'd say take the leap. It's a well-trodden journey, but there's a lot of folks out there who could do great things if they took the leap. So I would encourage you to do it. Well, I think that's that's very cool. And, and as a CEO, and now a CEO of a very sizable company today, 
Give us a picture of like what's a day in the life of uh, of, of your life that'll really look like. Is it as is, is it as easy and as glamorous as it looks like on the oh, outside? Of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, it's different, right? I think we look at the world through these lenses, and so the job is to really ensure that that's the way we look at through the world. So that's right. recruiting. That's um, helping kind of unblock our own team from what they're capable of. Uh, and so the day looks very different every day. Yeah. I'm sure you'd, you'd yeah, agree, right? Totally. It's, every day is completely different. A lot of what we're trying to do is sort of close the gap between what Verset is today and what we can be. And right. if we can make progress along that spectrum, then that's a good day's work. And so for me, sometimes that's uh, you know dealing with internal stuff. Sometimes that's external. Sometimes that's doing cool podcasts with uh, with folks like wow. you. Really um, so yeah, that, it really man. it really depends. But it's always a joy. You know, you're such an engaging guy when you agreed to do our podcast. I've made my day, by the way. Like you're you're a great guest. And of course, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't ask you for advice to us. Like you actually know a fair amount about Connect First Credit, mm -hmm. and you served on the board for quite yeah. a few years. Yeah. So I had a lot to do with getting us where we've arrived at here today. I guess my question to you is what advice do you have for us for the next decade and in, in mm. trying to become the best credit union we can be? Yeah, I mean, I love that question. I think it's such an amazing opportunity and, and this is my time to shower some prayer. I think there's been a tremendous amount of value created in the last little while about the things you're thinking about. So I think uh, oh. the organization's on the right track. You know, one of the, uh, I think, important lessons that, that I've observed or maybe heuristics around building a lot of different products for all sorts of different companies is that the context of something is where the value is created. And the kind of dumb analogy is like, if you have uh, a steak, sometimes that's great. And sometimes a hot dog is great. Those are very different things. Yeah. The context <laughs> really matters, right? Like yeah. sometimes you just want a hot dog. You're at a baseball yeah. game, you don't want a steak. But other times yeah. you're at a nice restaurant. So context matters, even things can be good. And I think that's something that's sort of been lost in the mm. uh, financial services industry. Is like, what is the context that I am in? And how is this actually helping right me be better as a person? How do I make progress in my life because of this in, in relationship with... Uh, with a credit union or, or a bank. I think part of that, that discovery process is, again, thinking about not how do we retool a bank to serve a need better, it's but what, are, what do our members need? Yeah. How do we embrace that? And sometimes that leads you to different paths than what you have. And so I see there being some big opportunity there. Um, and, and that's an exciting thing. You know, mm. there's, uh, there's so much opportunity in financial services. If you think about it, like many of the things that we're doing today are the things we were doing 20 years <laughs> yeah, ago. And we'll probably be the things we'll be doing in 10, right? right. But the ways that we interact with that um, are different. And I think clients are smart. Customers are smart. They see the world through this, uh, this lens of experience. And right. so the, the more we can meet them on those, those journeys and actually give them something interesting, you can unlock a lot of, a lot of progress. So I see that opportunity in, in spades. And I think, um, I think Alberta is already showing that they're embracing this model. But that's, that's what I'm excited to see. I really appreciate that insight, actually, very much, Doug. And I guess maybe on a grander scale, like you are leading a global company right here, from right here, and you're out in the world and you're, you're hearing voices many of us don't get to hear. Bringing that back to the Alberta context mm -hmm. in, that, uh, in that example you just gave, like when you look ahead at the next five to 10 years, like mm -hmm. what are your predictions for this province and, mm -hmm. and what do we need to be thinking about um, in the yeah. next decade? I'm an optimist. I will say that I'm a realistic optimist, so I, I have great, great hope in Alberta. And I look at that through so many different lenses. Like, even if you just look at it at the most rudimentary net immigration <laughs> statistics, yeah, yeah, right? like people are yeah. coming to Canada, they want to be here. People right. from all over the world, their dream is to be here in right. this country. And I think there is an amazing richness that comes from the fact that this is an on-demand place to be. So just by pure demographics, that's an exciting thing. You know, sometimes uh, being on the right trend line can be a, a huge uh, tailwind on this kind of stuff. So even if you just reduce it to that, that's interesting. But I think one of the, uh, the concepts that I just really embrace is this concept of being a live player. And companies <laughs> can be a live player, individuals can be a live player, but the definition there is the ability to do new things well. Right on. And I think that's the magic. If, if you're able to do new things well as a city, as a company, as an organization, um, you're always going to be able to adapt and be agile. I think Alberta is a place that does new things well. Hmm. And, and that's, that's what's the source of my optimism. That ability to kind of reshape and reinvent and think about things in new ways, that's part of the, the sh really short DNA of the province. I mean, this is, we have not been here that long, right? right? <laughs> yeah, about yeah, it, right? Yeah. So, so much of the stories to be written. And uh, I think Alberta is a live player. And that's why I choose to live here. And I think there's a lot of, you know, opportunities to see where that can go. Doug, I love that. Now, I would be completely remiss in letting you go without, uh, you know, actually asking you if you have any thoughts for our audience and anything you want to share about Verset and what you're doing mm -hmm. um, in the world. You know, I'd say 
find opportunities, find space to really think about the value that you're creating for your customer, your client. And I say that because there's so much opportunity to kind of close those little mini friction points along the way that can be really meaningful. It can really drive a lot of purpose for your organization to know that you're connecting with those paths. And so I, I always try to encourage people to, to really think about who you're serving, how you're doing that, what are the ways of doing that. And uh, and I think one of the, the terms that you've uh, mentioned a lot is kind of, can businesses be beautiful? I think, I think that is a contributing factor to that, to really mm-hmm. think about that full view. And man, it's exciting to sit down with, uh, with entrepreneurs, with leaders, with teams who have this ambition. They're trying to figure out how to unlock it. And it usually starts with that spark of saying, well, where are those friction points and what, what can we do about it? What, what's possible here? Uh, oh. And that's always an exciting part. Doug, thank you for being on the show. You are an awesome guest and, and I'm so glad to have had you here. This is an absolute privilege. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Doug. Next steps. Doug is a great guest and he's given me a lot to think about. I hope he's shared some things that have given you something to think about. And I I just want to go over some of them because there's some really thought provoking ideas here from an individual who's built a really, really successful business in our province that has gone global. And that's, I think, a really important point here. It's not just somebody who's doing business here, somebody who's, who's identified ways to solve problems for businesses around the globe. You know, one of the things that he mentioned was how important it is that to recognize that success breeds success. And now that we're really starting to see some success in our province, in, in Calgary and Edmonton and, and across the province, we're starting to see that convert into the reinvestment in new business ideas. And, you know, one of the things he said is how important it is that we're funding um, these new ideas and ensuring there's free flowing access to that capital. And, and that ecosystem is starting to get created, which I think is a reason for optimism for all of us. And he talked a lot about how important it is to really focus on the dis- demand side of the market and, and the world in terms of what the world needs, what people need, what businesses need, what entrepreneurs need, as opposed to the supply side. Just because we have it doesn't mean that is what the most important thing the world's going to want from us in the future. And he had some great examples for that that really got me thinking. Another comment, which I think is lovely and certainly something we're going to take back to Connect First Credit Union, is the notion of context. You know, people don't uh, change banks every day. They don't, you know, need to sign up a technology company every day. It's about the context of the situation. Of course, the hot dog versus steak was a great, uh, great example of that. Um, you don't necessarily go to the finest steak dining restaurant and order a hot dog. That's not the moment you're likely going to do it, although who knows. And finally, um, when we think about, this was my favorite parallel, actually. When we think about... Um, you know, the future of, uh, you know, your financial future and, and what uh, you're hoping to do. That's a journey that, um, you know, if you take it on your own, you're, uh, you might be on, <laughs> on your own. But if you ha- find a partner who you can co-create that with, I think you, you put yourself in a position for way more success. And certainly that's the kind of organization we want to build at Connect First. And finally, if you want to think about, um, you know, our future as a province, and talking a little bit about how we can be a very adaptive place and how we really can re- rewrite our history, I think is something that we certainly want to be thinking about as a province because this is a place that people from around the world want to be and Doug has seen it firsthand and that was great. So with that, uh, all my, my big thanks to Doug as being a great guest. If you liked what you heard today, share it with your network and be sure to subscribe. Thank you for listening and be sure to listen next time on What's Next Alberta. Alberta.